Uh, I got to tell you, the book of Ruth, which is where we're going to be today, if you have your regular Bibles, turn to the book of Ruth, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, Ruth, and uh, if you have your story Bible, then turn to chapter 9, because that's where we're going to be in just a few minutes. But what I was going to tell you is Ruth, Ruth is one of my top two or three books out of the entire Bible. And so I get stoked when I get a chance to preach on the book of Ruth. So uh, I had somebody, as I was leaving the 8 o'clock service today, said, Tim, a little less coffee. A little less coffee. <laughs> if we could shrink the earth's population to one single village and keep all of the existing human ratios remaining the same, here's how that village would look, Okay. Reducing the entire world's population to one village and keeping the dynamics of the world equivalents the same as it is today. Here's what that village would look like. 57 Asians. 21 Asians. Chani. Where's Chan? Oh, he would be proud to know that. 57 Asians. 21 Europeans. 14 from the Western Hemisphere, both North and South. 8 Africans. 52 would be female. 48 would be male, 70 would be non-white, 30 would be white, 70 would be non-Christian, 30 would be Christian, 6 people would possess 59% of the entire wealth, and all 6 would be from the United States, 80 would live in substandard housing, 70 would be unable to read. 50 would suffer from malnutrition. One would be near death. One would be near birth. One, yes, just one, would have a college education. And one would own a computer. What an interesting demographics that puts in my head. When you consider our world in this compressed perspective, I think all of us see what a great need there would be for acceptance and understanding. Every high school senior understands that idea about acceptance and understanding. When your high school senior applies to a college, what do they wait for? They wait for that letter or that card that says something besides, I'm sorry. <laughs> they are waiting for the one that says those two incredible words, or three if you don't conjugate the word, you are accepted. Those are great words, and all of us like to hear something like that. You're accepted. I understand there is one university in this country that after it mails out its acceptance cards, a week later, it mails out a t-shirt to that new student. And the t-shirt says, I know where I'm going. <laughs> Those two phrases are powerful expressions. You're accepted. And I know where I am going. I don't care who you are. Whether you're a high school senior or you're some big shot in the auditorium today. Those two phrases are what our soul longs to hear, that we are accepted and that we know where we're going. All of that together is exactly the message that we are going to cover in chapter 9 of the story today. Before I dive into maybe one of the most beautiful stories of all time, certainly one of the most beautiful out of the Old Testament, I want us to do a real quick rewind or rerun for two reasons. One, for those of you who are faithfully reading along and studying the story, we want to continue to repeat the basic flow so that this gets anchored in your mind. And for those of you who might be new at New Hope today, maybe you'll get an idea of where the story of God fits in to the, and today's story, particularly fits into the overall story of the Old Testament and God's one seamless story throughout Scripture and His one seamless story throughout time. First of all, we understand that as the story opens in Genesis chapter 1, that God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit has this grand vision 
to extend community to people. In order to extend their community to people, they're going to have to create some. And so God creates Adam and Eve. And he puts them in this wonderful place called the Garden of Eden. And the scripture tells us that God comes and walks with them in the cool of the evening. And they have this incredible fellowship. But these two people, Adam and Eve, have a different vision for their future than God had for them. And they messed it up. They ruined it. It's called the fall. Now the rest of the Bible, from Genesis chapter 3, is the story describing the extent of what God will go to in order to get us back. That's God's supreme passion. His supreme desire is to come spend time with you and for you to want to spend time with Him. God wants to come hang in your neighborhood. He wants to spend time with you where you spend your time. God's plan is to get His people back. Even though we deeply hurt Him, He deeply loves us. The main plan begins to unveil itself in the Old Testament in the book of Genesis, starting in chapter 12, where God starts a brand new nation. And God starts this new nation with just one man and one woman, kind of like Adam and Eve. He starts with Abraham and Sarah. Adam and Eve, they were fresh. <laughs> Abraham and Sarah, they were a little stale. Okay? They were really old. Okay? They were beyond childbearing years, and they didn't have any yet. And God says, I am going to make you all the parents uh, of this great, wonderful nation. And the reason he did that is he wanted there to be no other explanation but God for what happened. So read Adam and Eve and creation, Abraham and Sarah in their old age. No other explanation but God. So this timeline begins with this chosen family. This is the family that's talked about starting in Genesis 12. This new family is going to have a name called the nation of Israel. And Israel is a name that comes from Abraham's grandson Jacob, which meant deceiver. And he's changed because there's a heart change in his own life and it's changed to Israel. And it's God's intent in starting this family to form this new community. And it is through God's activity and fellowship and relationship with this growing community that he will reveal himself not only to this chosen family, but in the relationship with his family, God will reveal himself to the rest of the world. They can see how God, the real one true and living God is, and maybe they will forsake their false gods and want a relationship with the God of Israel. God never holds a gun to our head or a lightning bolt to our head. He never forces us into a relationship with him. God is wooing us back. Shelly and Don. Thank you. It was a little slow coming. I was having a little. Don, do you remember when you wooed Shelly? Did he do a very good job wooing? She's not real sure on the end. He did good enough to marry you. Right. Now, because I know the story just a little bit, he sort of messed up, didn't he? He had to woo you back again, huh? You see, God's not the one who messed up in this relationship. But when we messed up, God went a wooing after us. He wanted us to come back into a relationship with him. But it's a free choice to love God. He never forces us. Once things have been established for the children of Israel, God promised that he would give them their own land, their own place to live. He called it the promised land. It's later been known as Canaan. Now it's called Israel. It takes the Israelites a little while to occupy the land. The number of years from the time that God made the promise to Abraham and the time Israel actually conquered and occupied the promised land was how many years? Seven. Seven. Hundred. Very good. How could I expect you to remember that in one week? <laughs> the journey to the land involved a lot of stops and detours along the way. Without question, the longest stop was Egypt. <laughs> they went to Egypt because of a famine. And everything was fine for a while, and then they ended up slaves. And they were there for over 430 years. And that involved a long season of slavery. And it was the miraculous deliverance of the Israelites out of slavery through Moses' leadership. 
700 years after God founded this nation, they are now settled in their own land, land divided up according to the tribes of Israel. One of the areas of this land was given to the tribe of Judah. Judah. Judah was one of the sons of Jacob, who was named Judah. Right now, we will find out on page 121, all right, in the story, the first page of chapter 9, or in your Bibles, you will find it in Judges chapter 1, verse 1, that we are now in the period of the Judges. Ruth takes place. It's going to be refreshing today, because last week, as we were going through Judges, we read again, and again, and again, and again, this line. And the people did evil in the sight of the Lord. And the people did evil in the sight of the Lord. And the people did evil in the sight of the Lord. Are you tired of hearing me say that? Yes. Think how God was tired of watching them live it. So that was last week. This week we have this breath of fresh air in this book called Ruth. We really see very little evil in this book. We see a book of acceptance, forgiveness, restoration, and encouragement. Maybe that's why you came today. It was for the purpose of acceptance and encouragement and a breath of fresh air. In the story, page 121, chapter 9 in the Bible, the book of Ruth, this beautiful story, only four chapters in length. Just before we read this opening line, I want to remind you that in the New Testament, Galatians chapter 4, verses 21 to the end of the chapter, the Apostle Paul makes a reference back to the Old Testament. And the Apostle Paul says, Now these things, referring to the story of Abraham and Sarah and the development of, of the nation of Israel, Paul says, Now these things that happened hundreds of years before, these things were written as an allegory. An allegory. A picture of one thing and the image of another. This is kind of like the upper and lower story. It's you and I, as we've been reading through so far and reading this, God's been trying to let us know that there are two perspectives to life. One, there's the upper story. That's his plan, promises, and provisions. There is the lower story. That's where you and I live on planet Earth. Too often, you and I live with our heads down, only seeing the frustration of lower story living. And God says, if you lift your eyes, see it from an upper story perspective, you'll have a far different view. And so we want to run our life on parallel tracks, upper story, lower story. God talks about this in the New Testament as an allegory. See the historical accuracy of what we're talking about. Learn from those lower story events, but see a much higher view. Learn something much deeper than you could in another way. See the underlying <coughs> leadership of God in all of this. And so we don't want to miss out on the allegory, the lower and the upper story. So anyway, the first couple of verses read this way. Page 121, Ruth, chapter 1, 1 and 2. In the days when the judges ruled, there was famine in the land. So a man from Bethlehem in Judah, together with his wife and two sons, went to live for a while in the country of Moab. This man's name was Elimelech. Remember, we're going to try to see this upper and lower story. So I'm going to pause occasionally, give you little tidbits of information. The name Elimelech literally means, my God is king. That's a pretty cool name, isn't it? My God is king. His wife's name is Naomi. Naomi's name means pleasure. When my God is king, marries pleasure, they have two children. <laughs> Malan and Killian. Malan, Malan's name means Sickness. Killian's name means pining away. When my God is king, it's mixed with pleasure. You have a sickly family. Just hang on to those thoughts as we go on. I want you to remember a couple things about the opening of the story. First of all, remember, they're from Bethlehem. Does that name ring a bell for you? <laughs> the second thing I want you to notice is, once again, God is going to use a famine to work out his upper story plan. Just think of the number of times we've already encountered a famine and it became a catalyst for change or God's movement. As a father and a mother with two sons, Elimelech and Naomi have a choice to make. How they're going to provide for their family during the season of famine. Now remember, God said, when I put you in the land of promise, I will provide for you. Right? That was his promise. They're in the land. A famine has occurred. 
This family makes a decision to not trust God's promise. And they choose to leave their home. And they choose to go to the land of the Moabites. Moabite is not a part of the tribe of Israel. It's a pagan nation. They worship false gods. Elimelech and Naomi went there because they wanted, out of their own efforts, to feed and provide for their family. Apparently, it's not long after Elimelech, Naomi, and the two sons arrive in Moab that Elimelech, the father, dies. And these two sons must have been of marriage age when they went over there because Malan and Killian, with no Israelite women around, who are they going to fall in love with? Two Moabite women. One is Orpah, and the other is Ruth. Now, just a little side issue here. Because how many of you ever watched the Oprah Winfrey show? How many of you? Okay, all right. Just a little side issue. I understand this has been verified. This actually took place on one of her programs. Oprah's mother intended to name her daughter Orpah after this Bible character. But on the birth certificate, somebody transposed the P and the R, and her name became Oprah. So the next time that you were in Chicago hanging out with, with Oprah, call her Orpa, okay? Because she'll know what you're talking about because that really was her name. All right, moving right along. So Orpa and Ruth live in the land 10 years. And their two sons, Malin and Killian, died. And Naomi was left without two sons and her husband. That's page 121 of the story. As you enter into the story, imagine how devastated, awkward, and discouraged Naomi must have felt. Her husband's dead. Her two sons are dead. She lives in a foreign country. And we find out in the scriptures that Naomi really felt that God did this to her. How many of you have ever been through a tough time in your life and you felt like you said, why did God do this to me? Ever get drunk and wreck your car or get a DUI? God's fault, right? <laughs> Ever have a relationship? You didn't honor her or him or yourself. You ended up with a disease or pregnancy or complications at one time or another. Why did God do this to me? You ever activate those credit cards that people sent you <laughs> in the mail? And you use them to their maximum. And then you say, God, why did you put me in this debt? We feel like Naomi felt that God did it to her. And so as she is going back home, she says, I'm going to change my name from Naomi, which means pleasure, to Mara, which means bitterness. I am no longer a woman who experiences pleasure in life. I am a woman who experiences bitterness in life. And when you and I blame God for our own free will decisions, we end up very bitter people. Eventually, the famine ends. Naomi, with no sons, figures there's nothing left for her in Moab. So she decides to go back to Bethlehem, to Judah. You can imagine how absolutely humiliating it's going to be for her to go back to the relatives and the friends and the women in her neighborhood realizing that she has this horrible, devastating story. When you and I go away on vacation, or if you and I go away to school, or if we move away to take a new job, and we come back home, what do we want to do? We want to brag, absolutely right. We want to say, man, it was so good. I made such a wonderful decision. Things, you know all you guys who said, I wouldn't do that. Oh, we like to, we like to poke him in the eye. Okay, with how good things turned out. And now we have to come back and admit, I screwed up. We made a bad decision. We were wrong. It's interesting that her two daughters-in-law, Orpah and Ruth, that they want to go back with Naomi. So even though there's this sense of bitterness in this woman, there was something about this woman that was endearing to her daughter-in-laws. They wanted to hang with their mother-in-law. God bless them. <laughs> Just kidding, mothers-in-laws. I love them. Listen to the circumstances of her life. Page 122, verses 12 and 13 of chapter 1. She says to her daughters-in-law, Return home, my girls. I'm too old to have another husband. Even if I thought there was still hope for me, even if I had a husband tonight and then I gave birth to sons, would you wait until they grew up? <laughs> no, my daughters, you wouldn't. It's more bitter for me than for you because the Lord, and here it is, we're all now, the Lord's hand has turned against me. She's devastated, crushed at this stage in her life. She believes 
God's responsible. We will discover later in the story through the teaching of Scripture that she's wrong, but this is precisely how she felt. After the strong encouragement, Orpa decides to stay in Moab. But Ruth insists, Naomi, I am going with you. And these are where these famous words come from that you often hear quoted at a wedding ceremony. Or you see them on the Mizpah necklaces. You guys know what I'm talking about? The, 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 the necklace that's split in two and you put it together it makes one. Here's where these words come from. This is not really about a husband and a wife. Though that's his greatest application. This is about a daughter-in-law and a mother in law. <coughs> Ruth says these famous words, where you go, I will go. Where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people will be my people. Your God, my God. That last phrase, <coughs> Jill's is reading it. Here's why. What was God's plan in having a chosen nation? So that other nations would see how the God of Israel relates with his people. And they would want a relationship with him. Even though Naomi is in a despondent situation at this moment. There has been enough transpired over the years. That Ruth and Naomi have been together up until now. That, that Ruth is saying, man, the God of the Moabites, the God I grew up with. He is nothing compared to this God of Israel. So Naomi, I want to go with you. Why? Because I want your God. She is looking for acceptance by this awesome God of Israel. At the very core, Ruth wants to belong. She wants to be accepted by Naomi's family back in Bethlehem. She desires for the God of Naomi to accept her too. In a way, what she's doing is applying for a relationship and hoping it's going to work out. She doesn't get her acceptance letter before she decides to move. She steps out in faith with Naomi, not knowing what the outcome is going to be. It reminds me a little bit of the movie Rudy. You remember that movie, Rudy? A scale little guy who wanted to play football at Notre Dame. And, you know, he finally gets accepted. He gets to be kind of like the, the water boy, all right, on, on the team. And finally, get, finally he gets in in his career in one play. One play. The story of Rudy is much like Ruth. He, she stepped out not knowing what the outcome was going to be. And it turns out really well for both of them. If you know anything about the Old Testament, there could not have been a harder situation for Ruth's acceptance. It's kind of like Forrest Gump applying to Harvard. I mean, it's just going to be tough. She's a foreigner. She's an outsider. She's a widow. And it was her pagan people who just a few decades earlier had oppressed the Israelites for 18 years. It would be like accepting into your family to live in your home under your roof Somebody who would rip you off in business, cause you to file bankruptcy, and now they want to sleep in your house and have dinner at your table every night. Is that going to happen? <laughs> Most of us would say, uh huh. <laughs> and that's exactly the, faith, the, the situation that she was faced with. One thing we can say, though, in the life of Ruth is that she was proactive. While this is going to take a miracle, an act of God, for the things to light up and work out for her, Ruth is fully engaged in doing her part to provide for Naomi and herself. God desires us to be proactive, to reach out in faith. We don't have to... It was, a, uh, uh, it was Mark Addis this week in his testimony that he shared with the men's Bible study on Thursday. Thursday that he, he said he was reading the scriptures and he noticed where the, Jesus said to the disciples, you know, drop your nets, come and follow me. They didn't know where they were going. They didn't know everything there was to know about Jesus, but they knew enough to drop their nets and follow him. Mark said that cleared it up for him. He said, I still had lots of questions, but I decided I could wait to get all my answers. I could start following him before I knew what the, all the conclusions were to my questions. And that's Ruth in this situation. So, Ruth and Naomi get back to Bethlehem. They are hungry. They don't have any way to provide for themselves. And there's a law in the Old Testament called gleaning. And gleaning was basically a process where landowners were encouraged to allow the poor in the community, particularly women and widows, to come behind the harvesters and collect what was left over. And they would glean from the fields. And so that's exactly what Ruth is going to do to provide for her and Naomi. She is going to basically go and do what was the equivalent of banking in their society. And they did it for one reason, so they could survive, eat. Ruth happens, in quotes, Ruth happens to pick a field to glean that belongs to a relative of Elimelech and Naomi's. The relative's name is Boaz. 
Elimelech's name means, what did I tell you earlier? My God is king. Boaz's name means strength. Mighty man of power. It's a good family, all right? Good, strong names in there. And so Ruth goes to glean in the field of strength, the field of Boaz. And then we're told in Scripture that Boaz took notice of Ruth. Y'all understand what that means? <laughs> he thought she was pretty, all right? Mm -hmm. I mean, he had an eye for her, so he checks her out. And Boaz allows her to continue gleaning from the field, and he makes sure that no man will touch her. Because the poor and discarded the community often were taken advantage of. Boaz said, not to lay a hand on her. He made sure that. Then Boaz does two things I want you to take notice of. First, Boaz offers Ruth words of encouragement and acceptance. Page 123 of the story, Ruth 2.12 of your Bible says, may you, richly, may you be richly rewarded by the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come for refuge. Not only do I accept you, he says, but our God accepts you as well. He says it from his very own lips. He speaks those words right to her face. Let me ask you a question this morning. When's the last time somebody looked you eyeball to eyeball and offered you a word of acceptance and appreciation? I don't care if you're a kid or a big shot in some company. We all like to hear words of encouragement and acceptance. What comes out of your lips faster? Words of rejection? Words of spite? Or words of love, encouragement, and acceptance? In Ruth chapter 2, verse 11, we're given the primary motive of Ruth leaving her home country for Moab, where she had comfort <coughs> and potential of opportunity and gets her into a foreign land where she knew no one and was likely to be rejected. Her primary motive was selfless. She wanted to care for her discouraged mother-in-law. As it turns out, Ruth was not in the gleaning field just for herself or even primarily for herself. She was there to provide for Naomi. Boaz took notice of that and he offered his words of acceptance, but it didn't stop there. The second thing Boaz does is he follows the words with actions of acceptance. You see, it's one thing for us to say something nice. It's another thing for us to do something nice. And so Boaz goes to his harvesters and he says, guys, I know that you're not perfect harvesters. You don't, you don't clean the fields perfect. But he said, I want you to do a worse job than normal. <laughs> That's not what an employer usually says to his employees, does it? It's not what a guy involved in the harvesting business normally says. His, his, his future wealth is dependent upon how well they harvest. And he ends up going in and says, I want you to leave a lot extra in the field. I want you to leave it for Ruth. So Ruth is not only guaranteed food to take home from Edna and Naomi, but she doesn't even have to work very hard for it. She's received her first break. That night she goes home with her arms full of food. And when she lays it on the table, Naomi looks at her and says, ah! How did you do this? Blessed be the man who took notice of you. It was Boaz. The book of Ruth is full of this kind of language and acceptance. I'll ask you the question one more time. When is the last time in your home, in your neighborhood, with your family, at the workplace, that someone generally took notice of you? It feels good, doesn't it? I don't care if you're the kid of a big shot. It feels good for somebody to say, I care about you. I love you. How can I help? And it also feels good for us to say to somebody else, I love you, I care about you, what can I do to help? What a great love story. Ruth and Boaz, upon getting married under a concept in the Old Testament called the kinsman redeemer. You'll find this on page 125, but in the story they use the phrase family guardian. But I want to stick with the phrase that's found in the King James, the NIV, and the NAS, and because it sticks in my head for all these years, <coughs> kinsman redeemer. And I think when I finish the explanation, you'll understand why I like this phrase better. The law of the kinsman redeemer in society of Israel at that time was this. If a husband dies, the next of kin, the one closest in relationship, is given the opportunity to marry the widow. To marry her, the next of kin has to make plain, one, that he is the nearest kinsman. He's the closest in line. Then he has to pledge a couple of things. One, to purchase all the property of the dead husband, and he will preserve it for that wife and her descendants. Now, 
The part that's left a little bit out here, you have to read slightly between the lines and then do a little research on the culture. The full extent of the kinsman redeemer is this, is if you marry one of your relative's wives, who's widowed now, if she does not already have a son, it is your job as the near kinsman to provide a son with her for your deceased relative's name to be perpetuated in the tribe that you were a part of. So you were to be able to pay the price for land, and you were to be able to pay the price for the lineage. Okay? Wow. That's a lot of responsibility. That's the concept of the kinsman redeemer. The next of kin has the right to marry, purchase, and provide descendants. Now Boaz gets this idea, wow, we're part of the same family. I could be your kinsman redeemer. But he discovers a problem. He is not the closest relative. He's down the line. And so Boaz then says, well, I'm going to go talk to the next of kin. I'm going to see what his intent is. You see, I suspect this. I suspect the next of kin already knew that Naomi was back in town with her daughter-in-law. I suspect he already knew he had a responsibility to carry out. I also suspect that he knew he couldn't accomplish the task. And so he just ignored the situation. And so Boaz goes to him and says, what is your intent? And he explains what's going on. The guy says, well, okay, I'll take care of it. And the, the scripture says that he couldn't pay the price. He didn't want to get his property and the property of those descendants confused. And here's one of the reasons, because he would have had to have fathered a child with Ruth. And that might create confusion in the inheritance of the two lineages down the road. And then he looked at Boaz and said, I can't do this. I'm not able to pay the price. Well, he wasn't a poor man. So it's not the money he couldn't do. It's the life he couldn't give. He couldn't give to Ruth children. And hang with me just for a moment. Remember I told you at the beginning, Galatians 4 says these things were written as an allegory, historical truth, but reflecting an upper story perspective. Boaz in the Old Testament is a picture of Jesus Christ, the kinsman redeemer. He comes to pay a price for us. Who would be the nearer kinsman that had first right to you and me, but couldn't pay the price? I'm not going to let you think too long. It's called the law. The law of the Old Testament was given prescribing the sacrifice and the actions that were necessary to stay right before God in the Old Testament until the sacrifice of Jesus Christ could come years later. What, what can the law not give? The law cannot give life. In fact, in the New Testament, it says the law brings <coughs> sin and death. The law brings death, but the Spirit brings life. And so the law could not do for us what Jesus could. And so Boaz is a picture of Jesus Christ. Grace. And the dear kinsman is a picture of the law. It did its job for a while, but it was ineffective. Now, there are many lessons we could draw, but the big part of the upper story in the book of Ruth is the message of acceptance. God wants all people, not just Israel, to be included. The big message that flows out of the four chapters of the book of Ruth that we need to walk away with from here is the powerful message of acceptance. That God doesn't want to spend time only with the Israelites, but God wants to spend time with all people who want to be included and accepted. Taking it back to the college analogy that I opened up with, three specific things. Number one, Ruth receives her acceptance letter. She was accepted in the family even though she was an outsider. The second thing is, she gets a full ride. Ruth's kinsman redeemer paid the full price. When you're staring down a bill for college, and it's overwhelming, isn't it great for somebody to say, okay, I couldn't remember this, in the I need, I need to go in here. Come on, Gene. <laughs> that new, new Testament phrase, Jesus on the cross, and in the, the, the Greek it says, testo, test. In English it means painful. Okay? Jesus on the cross says that word in the, the Greek or the Hebrew, and it literally means 
paid in full. Debt has been wiped out. Man, wouldn't it be great when along with the acceptance letter from the university, it says, fully funded. Wouldn't that be awesome? That's exactly what happened to Ruth. Not only did she receive an acceptance letter and a full ride scholarship from Boaz, but the third thing we see throughout the whole story is that Ruth is not only a receiver of acceptance, but she is an agent of acceptance. Ruth and Ted from the beginning all the way to the end of the story is extended to Naomi. She wanted to personally be involved with acceptance and giving and sharing with Naomi. Sometimes you and I get a little hard-hearted. Our hearts are not as tender as Ruth's. There was an ingenious teenager who got tired of reading to his baby sister bedtime stories. So he decided he would record several of the favorite stories on a recorder. And he told the sister, now, anytime you want to hear a story, you don't need me. Just push the button. Isn't that great? She looked at the recording machine and she looked at her brother and she says, no, it doesn't have a laugh. <laughs> See, she wanted the relationship. That's what God wants with you and me. The law did not have a laugh to rest in. Jesus does. We think the story is about Naomi's family accepting Ruth because Naomi is the one from the family of Israel. But in reality, it is Ruth extending acceptance to her mother-in-law. Ruth's primary motive for coming with Naomi was to assist Naomi to make sure she was provided for. And as it turns out, Ruth is not so concerned about her own as she is with somebody else as she was selfless. When her financial house was in order, Ruth now has the means to care for Naomi. And as the story comes to an end, it goes beyond our expectation. Ruth and Bo Boaz end up having a son. And the woman of the town says to Naomi, when the son is born, Praise be to the Lord, who this day has not left you without a family. May he become famous throughout Israel. He'll renew your life. He'll sustain you in your old age for your daughter-in-law who loves you and who is better. Listen to this. This is unheard of in this culture. Your daughter-in-law is better than seven sons. And sons were premier in that culture. And these women are saying, your daughter-in-law is better than seven sons. She's given him birth. Then it says, Naomi took the child in her arms, cared for him. And the women living there said, Naomi has a son. What thrilled Ruth more than anything was that Naomi was restored with hope and vigor. Nothing does that, I'm told, like a grandchild. I don't know that from personal experience. I'm not old enough to have grandchildren yet. <laughs> if that's a problem, take it up with Chad and Missy. <laughs> I think I might prompt that just a little bit. <laughs> Ruth was not only the recipient, but the agent of acceptance. Now as we look, how do we apply this to our daily lives? There are some huge applications. First, you and I long to be the recipients of acceptance. We want to know that others have accepted us. We're Gentiles. Most of us in this room, very few of us probably in here, have any Jewish or Hebrew blood in you. All right? Gene claims he has some, but he can't prove it. Okay? We have a couple of others, all right, who I know are. But, but the vast majority of us, we're the Moabites. We're the Gentiles. God unveils his plan here in this story. He wants to spend time with all of us. Here's the question. Have you ever submitted your application to him? Just as a student flies for college, <clears throat> just as a Christian attending New Hope wants to become a member here, a little short application, ever submit the application? I promise you, you'll get an instantaneous response from God. Accept it. Accept it. Pay in full. Accept it. Why? Because the resume we submit when we apply is not our own resume. We get to submit the resume of Jesus Christ. And we find acceptance in His Son. The story of Ruth shows us clues of what is yet to come that the New Testament will unfold. In addition to being recipients, we realize in the story we're called to be agents of change. Not only to receive, but to give as well. To everyone in our life, we seek to be agents of acceptance. We should seek to shower words of acceptance on them. As part of God's family, we should seek to extend acceptance to those who are outsiders and who think there's no way they could be included because of what they have done or how they've lived or what their standing is. They are accepted. Let me ask you a serious question. Have you recently been an agent of acceptance? 
by word and action. There's a lot of lonely people in our community today who feel like outsiders. There's probably people sitting in pews right near where you are who even though in the midst of a full sanctuary feel lonely and isolated. What have you done to reach out, to affirm in ways like Ruth did? God's calling every one of us to be a Boaz to somebody. Here's just a few ideas. Let me toss out at you real quick. Take time to get on your knees out here between the buildings with one of the little kids. Just ask them how they are, what they've learned today. They may not have a grandparent. Their family may be in a very dysfunctional state. You have no idea how your word can be of help to a small child. Volunteer for Celebrate Recovery. Those people who have hurts, habits, and hang-ups, those people who are just like you, you just haven't admitted it yet, and they have. <laughs> Volunteer. Give them a hand. Volunteer in our children's ministry, 915, 1045. Jesus said, don't stop the little children from coming to me, for such is the kingdom of heaven. I can't tell you, if we took the time to get testimonies of people in here, I bet you there'd be over 50% of the folks in here who would tell you they came to know Jesus Christ because of the influence of a Sunday school teacher when they were a child. It starts. It starts. Mentor a teen. Talk to Robert. He'd love to have adult mentors to come along, some of the young guys and the young gals. Go on a short-term mission trip. In fact, we're leaving in two weeks. If you can't go that quick, show up at the pie auction tonight. We need your money. <laughs> do chores or a project for a single mom or a senior citizen and buy a single parent family over for a little R&R &R. speak encouragement into a person who is going through struggles invite a widow or a widower over for dinner and I guess if you're a widow and you want to invite a widower over for dinner you can do that too but that wasn't what I had in mind at the moment have your family or a little Bible study group go to a nursing home and visit those who were alone and celebrate special days in their lives. If you're in here and you're a junior high, high school, college age kid, you can sit next to somebody who's new in the classroom, sit next to somebody who's alone at the lunchroom. How about prepare us? Many of you do this right now. Prepare a meal for a family in need because of struggles or challenges going on in their life. Now, now, here's a little icing on the cake for this story of Ruth. Remember I told you that Elimelech's name, that my God is king? He married Naomi, whose name meant pleasure, and they had those two kids, sickness and pining away. Ruth's name means beauty of a contrite spirit. And, but by the way, Orpha kissed Naomi, and she left her. Is that a picture of anything in your mind? Mm -hmm. Things like in the Bible, when you kiss you, you better watch out because you're not going to be left in the grave. <coughs> Ruth, the beauty of a contrite or humble spirit, marries strength, mighty man of strength, Boaz, and they have a child, and that child's name is Obed, and the name Obed means worshiper. So when strength and humility are married together, they provide one who worships God. When strength and humility is combined in your life, you cannot help but be a worshiper of God. Obed. <laughs> Who in the world is Obed? Obed is the grandfather to King David. Wow. Everything works out. God is doing his plan from an upward four story perspective. There's going to be one board who will provide the way, the Lamb of God, the way, the truth, and the life, the deliverer, the redeemer, and all these Old Testament stories point to him. We are told that Jesus Christ would be born out of Israel, out of Judah, out of Bethlehem. Where does the story of Ruth take place? Out of Bethlehem, out of Judah, all right, out of the nation of Israel. You see this? Ruth and Boaz give birth to a son named Obed, who gives birth to a son named Jesse, who gives birth to a son named David. The genealogy of Jesus in Matthew chapter 1 says he comes from the line of David, from the tribe of Judah, born in the city of Bethlehem. Pretty straight arrows, isn't it? 
Jesus Christ is the ultimate kinsman redeemer. We were slaves to our sin. We were outsiders. We were lost because of our inheritance from Adam. And then Jesus redeems us with the price of his life. Just like Ruth became the bride of Boaz, you and I become the bride of Christ. And we now can say, I'm accepted and I know where I'm going. Because Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you. That where I am, there you may be also accepted and a destination. Not only did he go out of his way to include not only did God go out of his way to include a Moabite woman in the lineage of Jesus, but he used Boaz's mother as well in the lineage to reflect acceptance and destiny. And guys, do you know who Boaz's mother was? Do you remember reading it? Who was she? Rahab! The hooker for Jericho! <laughs> The one who hung the red rope in her window. And because of that red rope, she is the only one in her family who was saved when the walls came tumbling down. Do you now understand why Boaz probably was so quick to respond to Ruth, a mole by woman? He understood the meaning of acceptance. Because he knew what his mother had been through and he knew what could have happened to her. And because God smiled upon her, because God accepted her, because Joshua brought her in to the family of Israel, this was his mother. And so he looked upon a Moabite woman with that same compassion and love and acceptance. Wow. Do you understand why I love the book of Ruth so much? God tells us again and again, God, I didn't come just for Israel. I didn't come just for these little people we might call the church. I have come, no matter what your background or culture, behavior, or actions or attitudes have been, I've come for every one of you where you have a choice to spend time with me. Do you need to submit an application today? Do you need to invite Jesus Christ to come live in your life? Why don't you do that when we close in prayer this morning? For the vast majority of you, you've already submitted the application. You've already got your letter back that says approved, accepted. But you'd have to acknowledge that maybe you just share mere words with very little action to acceptance and courage. And why don't you say, God, I'm ready for you to use me like you used a Rahab and like you used a Ruth. I'm ready for you to use me to share your life with somebody else. Let's pray. Dear Father, if there's a man or woman sitting in here today who's never submitted an application to have a relationship with you, and Father, you know that's a tongue-in-cheek expression to simply say, any man, any woman, any boy, or any girl at any time of life can say, God, I'm discovering I'm not God. I don't handle life very well. And I'm ready to have a relationship with you. I don't know everything there is to know about you, but like Peter and James and John, like Mark Addis here at New Hope, I am ready to follow and trust you and let you fill in the blanks as I go through my life. But God, I want to, I want to invite you to come be a part of my life. You have made a proposal to me of marriage. You want to spend all eternity with me, and I'm ready to say yes to that proposal. We often can be critical. We often speak negative words. We often do negative acts. And we wonder why we get negative responses. Oh God, may each of us look closely at our own heart, giving you permission to shine the searchlight of your, your truth into our lives and reveal to us. And may we humbly say, God, I'm sorry. And give you the opportunity to do in us a story like Ruth and Naomi. None of us are hopeless. No situation is beyond your recovery. But it takes the free will and the free choice of any man, any woman, any boy, any girl to say yes to what you want in them. Father, for the vast majority of us here who have already known that we are accepted in your family, may we have a prayer in our heart that says, God, I'm ready for you to use me in word and action to give comfort, encouragement, and hope to someone else. In Jesus' name, we thank you for your leadership. Amen. Amen. You guys, have a great afternoon. Before you leave, one more time. Do this. Up, 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 down. Up. Yeah. All right. well, come on, all of you, all of you. Up, 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 up. Come on, come on, come on.